Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to MIT and to HTC Forum. My name is Christiana Bonin. I'm a PhD student in the History, Theory, and Criticism of Architecture and Art program here at MIT. We also go by HTC. Um, I am also co-chair of HTC Forum this semester, along with my colleague Deepa Ramaswamy, who's up here in the front row. Um, before we begin, I wanted to offer some thanks to the Department of Architecture, who's co-sponsoring tonight's presentation as part of their main lecture series. And I also want to thank the Lipschatz Steber Fund for providing generous funding for this presentation. Before we begin, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what HTC Forum is in just two sentences. And basically, it provides the opportunity for us students to select um, and invite those scholars who we find most intellectually compelling and challenging to come to MIT. So Forum is a space for conversation and discussion among our department, but also we seek to engage the broader, the broader art and architectural community in Boston and Cambridge. So that's HTC Forum. And in that vein, I'm very pleased to present and introduce to you our speaker tonight, Keller Easterling. She joins us from Yale University, where she works as an architect, a writer, and a professor. Professor Easterling's lecture this evening shares the title of her most recent book, Extra Statecraft, which examines global infrastructure networks as a medium of polity. Another recent book, titled Subtraction, also from 2014, considers building removal, or essentially how to put the development machine in reverse. Many of you here will also know Professor Easterling's earlier fundamental books, such as Enduring Innocence from 2005, which researched uh, familiar spatial products in difficult or hyperbolic political situations around the world. And many of you will also know her text from 1999, Organization Space, Landscapes, Highways, and Houses in America, which applied network theory to a discussion of American infrastructure. I really look forward to Professor Easterling's lecture. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'll tell you more about this urban porn later. Um, but I think most of you know that I look at spaces like this. Um, and if we sort of speed through the images of the space that most of the world is swimming in, like this space, the retinal afterglow is of a soupy mix of details and repeatable formulas that make most of the space in the world. So beyond the singularly crafted enclosure or the geometrical formal object, buildings are, are often reproducible products, what I've called spatial products uh, that proliferate globally. And they are the, you know, the familiar confetti of brightly colored boxes that are nestled in black asphalt or bright green grass and are telling elaborate stories about Arnold Palmer golf and Starbucks coffee and beard pop-up cream puffs, and they're the same in Milwaukee, or this is Inner Mongolia. And now there are formulas not only for buildings, but also for entire cities. We don't build cities by accumulating masterpiece buildings. Um, we have a, a logistical formula for cities, and typically the urban formulas replicate Shenzhen and Dubai, anywhere in the world, with a drumbeat of generic skyscrapers. So that cities are almost infrastructural technologies. They are infrastructural technologies. And, and, and uh, it's tricky using that word infrastructure, but obviously I don't mean an infrastructure of pipes and wires hidden underground, um, but a kind of cartoon of abstract technical and economic logics that far from hidden is actually pressing into view. So then these infrastructural technologies are not the urban substructure, but the urban structure itself. And what I can report is that some of the most, what you're well aware of, is that some of the most radical changes to the globalizing world, some of the most consequential changes, are being written in the language of this infrastructural matrix space. 
It generates de facto forms of polity that can outpace law, and it's a secret weapon of some of the most powerful people on earth. And it's administered by uh, uh, public and private actors driven by profound irrationalities. And it forms what I've called a kind of extra state craft that's wilder than any of the leviathans for which we have some kind of studied response. Um, and the portmanteau, extra statecraft, what I mean is outside of and in addition to the state. Um, so it's not kind of a post-national view, but, it, but, but the idea that the, that the nation state just has a newer, sneakier partner, uh, you know, so someone who is outside of, but in addition to and even strengthening the state. So the book that uh, Christiana uh, mentioned, this um, book, Extra State Craft, I'll, 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 I'll talk to you about it as a, as a dilemma of writing also, uh, to write about these uh, kinds of spaces. And for me, a, a, you know, a book is more than a kind of monograph or, or, or uh, padded article. It, it, it presents the possibility for some kind of adventure in thinking some kind of way of changing a habit of mind, and it is a companion, something to think with. Um, and, and I'm asking a lot in, in the book. I'm asking um, to, first of all, unfocus your eyes to see not only the building, but the matrix in which the building is being suspended, a matrix space that, that I'm arguing has the power and currency of software that I'm likening to a kind of operating system for shaping this city. Um, and, and one's also asked, in, in a moment of ubiquitous computing, to think of space itself as an information system, whether or not it's enhanced with uh, digital technology. So it's almost as if one would need to think about Gregory Bateson calling a man, a tree, and an ax an information system. So information as it resides in the object forms like buildings, but also in the active forms that are like code, little bits of software in the, in the code that organizes building, a kind of updating platform, the protocols, routines, schedules that determine how objects and content will be organized and circulated, a spatial software of interdependencies and relationships. And, and right now, that, that this operating system is coded by experience economy uh, experts, by financial industry quants, by 28-year-old McKinsey consultants, by World Bank yes men and uh, quality management specialists. Um, and it's discussed in, term, in technical terms of informatics or econometrics. And kind of remarkably, uh, n even though there are spatial byproducts, no one is actually leading with spatial variables. Um, so if infrastructure space is the, most, is the secret weapon of some of the most powerful people in the world, one wonders if it's a secret or one doesn't want it to be a secret best kept from those of us who are trying to make space. Um, and... and Many of the most interesting thinkers in the arts and the sciences are also shifting focus from object to matrix, looking for a more complex and indeterminate context in which to question the authority of their own disciplines or their, uh, the assumptions of their uh, master narratives, of their supposed science. So this infrastructure space, I'm arguing, also provides a kind of potent test bed for these inquiries. It, it's an, and it's a mistake for, f to think that these inquiries dilute our art with a kind of interdisciplinarity. Infrastructure space, it, um, when placed undiluted at an interdisciplinary crossroads, uh, in, in, in need of spatial variables, I'm arguing brings a new relevance to our art. We're, we're largely trained to make um, object form, you know, to assess it for outline, shape, um, uh, but we're not really trained to make the active form that's like the bits of code in the software. And I think it's actually a perfectly reasonable choice just to want to make object form. I think that's fine. Um, but, 
what if there's an artistic curiosity um, and also a, a, a perfectly reasonable, autonomous artistic curiosity about making the active form? What, and what if the world could use from us form making in another register, in another gear, in tandem with uh, and inseparable from object form? What if they could use from us an active form that's like bits of code in the software? It, in short, what if we know how to hack the operating system? And what if we know how to modulate the undeclared potential for productivity and violence that's latent in, in organization and, and unexploited in governance? And what if infrastructure space tutors us not only in an expanded repertoire of form making, but, but as a surprising and unorthodox expanded repertoire of political activism? So, so I want to talk about those, those possibilities, but I also, and I want to talk about this kind of form making, but, but I first want to put, look at some more evidence. Um, and the, if you end up taking a look at the book, you'll see it's, um, it's an experiment in narrative structure. It's trying to see, it looks like chapters, but in my view, if they, if they could be, they're almost like have different colored paper. Um, but there are six components that are meant to act like reagents to each other um, that one can use to think with, and they move between evidentiary segments and contemplative segments. And, and I'll be doing something like that, although, a book is a book, and so I, you know, this is this is only a lecture, but maybe it can hint at some of the content. Um, so, what, what are some of the evidence that I wanted to show you um, of all the spatial softwares that are currently circulating around the world? There's one dominant software uh, called the Free Zone, and it's it's the infrastructural technology that the world now uses to make cities. Um, you're looking at a promotional video, uh, the pro and then, then you were looking at one when you came in. Um, they're always the same. Um, there's a zoom from outer space that drops through clouds and locates a point on the Earth that's supposed to be the center of the Earth. And then there's a deep movie trailer voice that comes listing all the requisite features. Um, there's stirring music companies that swoop through cartoon skylines and resorts and suburbs and sun flares. And it's a, it's a relatively, what is the free zone? It's a relatively dumb enclave formula. It produces suboptimal economic results. No one even really knows why we use it except that the world has become addicted to its incentivized urbanism. And so it's become the world's most popular and contagious world city paradigm. But as a software, it's a kind of MS-DOS. But what's interesting to me is that the wild, the wild mutations of this form over the last 30, 40 years um, make it look insanely penetrable. Um, it, of course, begins, the, has ancient roots in pirate enclaves and free ports. But the zone uh, uh, mutated from an early 20th century warehouse compound for storing custom-free trade uh, to a mid-century UN-promoted export processing zone, which, was, which the UN promoted as a formula for jump-starting the economies of developing countries. And it, you know, you, you may have heard of the border industrial program, Machiadoras, and this, uh, it operated under authorities that were independent from the domestic laws of the, of the host country. So a zone, uh, and, and those movie trailer voices are repeating these mantras, uh, the zone provides uh, deregulation of labor law, deregulation of environmental law, um, uh, no taxes, no unions, uh, cheap labor, um, streamlined customs, etc. And while it remained in the backstage, uh, zone growth accelerated exponentially when China decided to use it as a market experiment. Um, and since then, it's exploded. China uh, constitutes its own zone category. It's an immense one. It employs, they employs most of the zone labor in the world. And it's in some ways made the zone a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, even though the World Bank and others knew it was kind of a suboptimal uh, economic formula. 
UNIDA thought the, the zone would dissolve back into the, um, into the domestic economy, but the opposite happened. Everything decided to locate within the zone. Why wouldn't they? To have this kind of lubricated uh, political quarantine and tax breaks and everything because the zone is a kind of a perfect island of corporate externalizing. So everything located within the zone and having swallowed the city hole, the zone now takes center stage as the germ of this city building epidemic that's reproducing all of the glittering mimics of Dubai and Singapore and Hong Kong all around the world. So the zone that used to look like this um, or this, this is Tijuana, um, now looks like this. Or if it used to look like this, it looks like this or this. Um, and while in the 1960s there were a handful of zones in the world, today there are thousands, some of them measured in hectares, some of them measured in square kilometers. Um, and uh, even though they don't produce optimal economic results, they're, they're you know, kind of egged on by, by global consultancies. They're treated as the essential signal for entry and entering into the economy of the global marketplace. So the zone is the nexus of every, every technology, a kind of clean slate, one-stop entry into the economy of a foreign country. Um, and now a kind of self-perpetuating agent in the growth of extra-state territory. It may not look the same as it did 30 years ago, but in its sweatshops and dormitories, it still harbors pretty grisly forms of, but stabilized forms of labor abuse. And, and uh, the zone is in this, I won't say evolution, but mutation has also begun to call itself a city. Um, perhaps even more than China, Dubai has used the zone to some distinct advantage. As you well know, it is an aggregate of enclaves, um, um, zones for every imaginable program, most of which have, used, have the word city in the title. Dubai Internet City, Dubai Healthcare City, Dubai Maritime City, Dubai... Silicon Oasis, Dubai Knowledge City, Dubai Media City, and each has a kind of different menu of exemptions or um, uh, uh, incentives. Dubai Media City has free speech. Um, Dubai Outsourcing Zone, Dubai International City, and but this is also the case all around the world. This is um, uh, outside of Hyderabad, um, high tech city. Um, and now, uh, now major cities and even national capitals want to have their own zone double, their own zone doppelganger, to, so that they, they can allow state and non-state actors to use each other as a kind of proxy or camouflage or, or double. Um, th and this is a very vivid um, vessel of extra state craft. Um, so this is, you probably know what this is, this is New Songdo City, which is a double of Seoul and the Inchong Free Trade Zone. Uh, but there are many more, Navi Mumbai, uh, I mean, when we look at the Shenzhen Hong Kong, um, uh, Shanghai Pudong. Um, but anyway, uh, New Songdo City uh, is what its developer Stanley Gale calls a city in a box. Um, and it's KPF, um, based on New York, Venice, and Sydney, so that it has a World Trade Tower, Central Park, Canal Street. Um, and then surpassing irony, you have something like Astana, which is a newly minted capital of, of Kazakhstan, moved, moved from Almaty and into, into a zone, into a little special zone. So this is the, the national capital which is supposed to be the center of law placed in the place of lawlessness, an exemption from law. This is President Nazarbayev's kind of part of his sort of paleo Genghis um, competition with Dubai. And that's him. And it's interesting to see on uh, a couple of nights ago, we showed a whole collection of the uh, urban porn at, uh, at storefront. Because um, uh, I've been collecting them. I mean, I've said there's scores of them, but... Uh, the, just showing a few of them, it's amazing how they have gone right around the world. There's, you know, 130 countries use these. Um, and then it's also fun to see, they, so they're so contagious, it's also then fun to see what 
kind of contagious things move within them, like the Color de Fountain, the kind of Macau style Color de Fountain has run right through all, all of the zones. Everyone has to have that now in addition to the mirror tiled skyscraper. So in some ways the zone is a, a strange intentional community um, as it begins to absorb these aspirations, but an intentional community with faith in golf or um, and with fantasy resorts and palaces where petrodollars can get away to relax. And the organizational and political constitution of the zone is often uh, portrayed in terms of openness, relaxation, freedom. Um, but as it maintains an autonomous control over a closed loop of circumstances, the, the zone really embodies a kind of isomorphic disposition, a kind of within which there is a, a kind of violence and also a kind of information paradox. A lot of all the org men that work in these um, zones are pulling down lots of information. It's information heavy, but it's uh, information, to, uh, uh, an enormous amount of information to remain information poor, a kind of what I've called a kind of special stupidity that's a common tool of power. For all its efforts to remain apolitical, it often ends up in the crosshairs of, of global conflict. While it's extolled as a uh, well, it's extolled as a neoliberal economic instrument, it's um, often just traded state bureaucracy for even more complicated forms of extra-state governance and market manipulation and regulation. It's a place where everyone speaks a kind of Esperanto of uh, quality management standards, um, quality management ease, and, and where a place where we find projects like, like Georgia's new city of La Zika, which was going to be built on a swamp near the Black Sea that would require um, going down 80 feet to, to uh, be able to support uh, the dream of the mirror tiled skyline. So for, and it, each of these is going kind of to the next poorest country. This is the dream. So for all its intentions to be a, a tool of economic and logistical rationalization, it's also become a perfect tool of irrationality, perfect crucible of irrationality. Um, so I want to show you another, look at another huge shift in global infrastructure space by dropping down into East Africa. Um, specifically Kenya, it was one of the last places on earth to receive international fiber optic cable and now one of the places poised to experience some of the most explosive uh, telecommunications growth. So this was, you know, at the beginning of 2009 with all the fiber optic cable um, lying at the bottom of the sea, East Africa was still relying on really expensive broadband from satellites. So it would cost 20 to 40 times um, what your what broadband would cost in the developing world. But now it has three international submarine cables that landed in Mombasa since 2010. Uh, at, 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 uh, by 2010, it's flush with broadband. It serves dense populations of cell phones. You know, these are the kinds of ads that appear in the tel images that appear in the telecom ads. But just, just to, I mean, I'm, I think you probably already know this, but, but in 2000, the world had 750 million um, cell phone subscriptions. It, and now there's over 6.8 billion and three quarters of them are in the developing world. So the, the world has changed enormously. Mo mobile telephony is the world's, what the World Bank calls the world's largest shared platform. I think this book is arguing that space is still the world's largest shared te uh, technology, but, um, but broadband infrastructure is, is treated as something that's a resource as important as, as water. Um, and in Kenya, uh, there are plenty of um, economists and McKinseyites and bankers on the ground and the development expertise is spoken in the languages of business and technology and informatics and econometrics, all trying to link broadband to things like GDP, like actually kind of finding a formula for broadband capacity and GDP or otherwise trying to kind of predict the effect of broadband on, on you know, what's called development 2.0. Um, and there's also plenty of entrepreneurs 
who are writing software for these billions of cell phones, entrepreneurs who really know how to use the cell phone as a, as a multiplier and a carrier of new relationships that have in, enormous spatial consequence. But still, um, the spatial consequences are treated as accidental byproducts. Again, there's no one really leading with spatial variables. I think any urbanist worth their salt would, would be able to understand the, the consequences of rail or highway, but we're probably pretty under-rehearsed in understanding the spatial consequences of broadband and microwave. Um, you know, there, it, and it's a mixture of things. There's a, there's a fixed linear uh, fiber that's buried in the ground. It territorializes almost like railroad. Um, and then there are an, there's an atomized population of cell phones. And then there are switches in between those. Um, and anywhere along the line, any of those switches can create a monopoly or a sort of choke point. The spatial consequences are potentially enormous. Um, but, but again, no one's deliberately writing the protocols that start with space in the broadband technoscape. And the only thing that's on offer there is what's on offer every place else. It's the zone, um, the outmoded zone. So, it, it, you know, you, you have things like tech Conzo, Conza Techno City, or is treated like a good idea, or Lapset. Lapset is a proposed <coughs> transportation corridor between Lamu and Juba, um, the capital of South Sudan. And so the plan is, you know, that it will be studded with zones and resorts and that it will um, carry oil to the coast. Um, so it's an old and, and really potentially dangerous development formula around heavy resource extraction. And then there's more planned, like Machakos, New City, or, or the new Kenya-China economic zone. Um, So in all of this infrastructure space, we, we're, we know we can contribute the object form. Um, we know we could contribute something like a, another skyscraper, and that's a completely legitimate experiment, we're, and we're really good at that. Um, but, but again, what, what if there's an artistic curiosity about designing not only the object form, but the active form that's like little bits of code in the software? And how, how do you begin to think about hacking into the world's most prevalent and powerful spatial softwares? How, how does one design something that's like a, a, a machine for producing space? And I try different ways of, of talking about this, but I, I, I'm, I, I think one, one way to say is that we already know. We already know how to do it. Um, uh, I, I think we do already know how to do it. Um, in, in, this, in this field of, of nearly identical suburban houses, we see object forms, but we also know that there's a simple software <clears throat> or there's an operating system at work here that, that's doing something. <clears throat> It has agency. It makes some things possible and some things impossible. Um, it's a simple, simple active form at work here. Um, it's a multiplier. Um, it's generating multiple slabs, roofs, frames uh, in this almost agricultural matrix space. And we know, we know we can go up and redesign one of these little houses we, we're, we know how to do that. Um, but we'd extend our power enormously uh, to also design an active form that acts like another multiplier or contagion that uses the organization as a carrier. Um, so a multiplier, um, you know, potentially changes this landscape in the same way an elevator changed urban morphology. And in some ways, you know, the cell phone we were talking about before is kind of the new elevator. Um, but what still, we don't, we don't usually treat spaces and urban organizations as actors. 
uh, but as collections of objects or volume. We would only assign agency to things that, uh, like car, moving cars or inhabitants. And, and we're, again, still less accustomed to the idea that space itself is a carrier of information, even when it's not coded with sensors or information technologies. But in, in this contemplation, spaces, however static, possess agency and information that resides in what we can only call a disposition, in relationship and relative position. A ball on an inclined plane possesses disposition through its geometry and relative position, potentials latent in its arrangement. That seems simple enough. And we, are, we already know about, about the topology or, or wiring of an organization. Um, and network topology begins with an urban question, the Königsberg Bridge problem. We, we know about the disposition, the latent potential in sequence, relationship, linkage. You, you know about this, so I don't have to explain it. But, but you know, that the, it was about the, you, it was a, sort of the bet in a pub that you couldn't get back to, this, to, the, to the pub without crossing the, one of the bridges twice. Um, but but is a contemplation about, about, about sequence, relationship, potential, latent in an organization. And, and I would argue that we know, we know the disposition of these organizations, and even that we know something about their political temperament. You know which one is like, you know, broadcast urbanism. You know that this is what we, you know, in the old Paul Baran uh, diagrams that, that uh, you, you, you know where, where uh, information is concentrated, uh, where power is concentrated, uh, where there are hierarchies. You know which one of these. You know which one of these operates like a railroad, and which one of these is like a smuggling ring. Um, and which one of these is like parallel computing? Which one of these is like linear computing? Um, you know the potential in these organizations. Can you still hear me? Is this, or is this annoying? Is this okay? um, um, so, so all of those things are like bits of code or active form in the, in the spatial equivalent of a software. We can design a multiplier or a delta or a valve or a governor or a switch. Um, in, in those cases, we're designing not one thing as object form, but an updating platform for shaping a stream of objects in ways that I think only we, as uh, people who know about space, can, can do. Um, one of my favorite examples of a, sp of a super simple spatial software is Savannah, uh, 18th century American city. And Oglethorpe didn't design an object form. Uh, he didn't design a plat uh, that you say, oh, this is what it looks like. Um, instead, he, he designed a set of interdependencies for a growth protocol. So the town would grow uh, by wards, uh, and each one had explicit instructions or relationships for quotients between public and private space. So, you know, there, sorry, this must be really annoying. Oh, put it on screen. Okay. Um, so the town would, would grow by wards, and, uh, and so public, private, and green space were, were in uh, some relationship. Uh, but then as well, with every ward, an agricultural space was saved beyond. So you could never know what the, you could never know the town's outline. You could never know what it was, um, you, uh, even if, but you had an explicit measured spatial instruction. It was a kind of time-released instruction uh, for the ongoing activities of urban space. And so, so this idea about active form, I uh, just hasten to say, is a non-modern proposition. Active form doesn't replace object form. It works with it. It propels it. But maybe, uh, hopefully, propels it into a kind of redoubled territory for operation, uh, one that brings with it 
different aesthetic pleasures, artistic pleasures, and political capacities. So in addition to object forms like buildings or master plans or econometrics or international standards that are all, all the familiar tools of global, go global governance, designers can manage interdependencies and population effects. A hack can release a germ or establish like this, a, a sort of time-released interplay between counterbalancing spatial variables that are capable of orchestrating or diverting or contracting or even, um, as uh, Christiana mentioned, I've been working on a book about subtraction, even deleting development. Sometimes I, I, I um, give the example of uh, Mark Twain, who was, uh, it sounds kind of corny, but uh, he was once, a, you know, as a steamboat captain on the Mississippi, he was, um, he talked about the way in which the passengers would all come out and take kind of, talk, look at the landscape as if they were kind of consuming pictures of the landscapes, uh, things that they could name. Uh, while he was looking at the river, he was looking at the face of the river, uh, looking for little rimples and r ripples and eddies and dimples um, that were signs of shoals and, and, and any kind of dangerous organization. He was, looking for the, he was looking at what we can only call the disposition of the river. He was reading the disposition of the river, the character or propensity of the organization that results from all of the active forms that are circulating within it. And in order to do that, he had to use use dynamic markers. And I think in this reading of the disposition of infrastructure space, this operating of infrastructure, operating system of infrastructure space, um, we're also working with dynamic markers. We're looking um, not at the message, but the medium. We're looking not at the f pattern that's printed onto the fabric, but how the fabric floats not the shape of the game piece, but how the game piece plays, not the object form, but the active form. Um, um, and th these active forms and the dispositions that they generate can be diagnostics in the fluid politics of extra statecraft, just like the ripples and dimples used for navigation. But, but one has to become artistically comfortable with the fact that they're dynamic. Um, that they're part of an ongoing process, that they are, and this sounds contradictory, but it is that they are indeterminate to be practical in the same way that the mar reading the markers on the river would be indeterminate to be practical. Uh, there's, a, there's a part of the book that I hope you like if you read it that's I hope you find something good to think with there, but um, that borrows a lot from Gilbert Ryle um, uh, when talking about the difference between knowing that and knowing how. Um, uh, infrastructure space is not that much about knowing that, but about knowing how. Um, um, the, the other thing that's, that's, that becomes, uh, uh, that lends an extra political capacity is that not only is it indeterminate, but it's often undeclared, um, uh, uh, carried in a process that can be discrepant. Um, from the script that's associated with it. And the reason why uh, infrastructure space is the secret weapon of some of the most powerful people on earth is for that very reason, that one can be saying something different from, from what you're doing. Um, and, and as we said, there's, there may be some extra political capacity in being able to adjust the temperament, the, the levels of violence or productivity or authority that are imminent in organizations. So if we go back to the zone, um, uh, in addition to designing the new skyscraper, um, maybe we can take advantage of the fact that the zone is already a contagious platform. We can design something to multiply within the zone um, and potentially change it as radically as it's changed over the last 30 years. M maybe one, one hint is that one can use the zone's own ambition to be a city as its own, maybe it's carrying the genetics of its own reversal, its own antidote. So maybe one way to hack the zone is simply to map some selected incentives um, uh, back 
onto the, city, onto the existing city instead of the ex-urban enclave. And in doing so, return the zone to the rule of law with regard to labor and environment um, and return more benefit to the domestic economy. Um, and, and in doing that too, one's also adjusting the temperament or the topology to reduce the violence of its isomorphism. I mean, it's a super simple idea. And most of the book doesn't, doesn't talk about what to do, but how to do it. Um, if, if there's one part of the book that talks a little bit about what if we did, what if we tried this um, quite simply, uh, the, the simplest possible idea, um, but it only becomes powerful if it's positioned as a multiplier within a population of zones. And how does one design that? That's much different from designing a master plan. Ex exploiting a contagion is much different than designing a master plan. Beyond the multiplier, the hacker of in infra infrastructure space also has a currency and in interplay, not things, but an interplay of counterbalancing forces that could operate like a little urban engine. Um, so in Kenya, for instance, um, if the desired outcome of, of broadband urbanism is access to information, then in this contemplation, we will be thinking of not only access to digital information, but access to the information of the city, the information that's, that's imminent in relationship, position, disposition in the city. So uh, new, the new softwares of interdependence that one might want to write here, uh, I mean, certainly the anti-zone we were just talking about makes sense. Um, in, in Nairobi, um, to think about... Um, mapping some selected zone incentives back into the city instead of the existing city instead of the urban enclave. But, 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 let's, but if you want to do more, um, just as there's a kind of a leveraging interdependence between public space and private space in Savannah, a zone incentive could, be, could become part of a software or active form of interplay if the, if the zone incentive is linked to something else. Um, um, I mean, one could look at any, any of these kind of anti-zones in Guadalajara or, Max, or, uh, or uh, Moscow or, or Quito or something. But in Nairobi, one thing that could be a link is between zone incentives and, and transit. Um, it's a, a, a city with almost no transit. Um, and that software, again, would not be a thing, but an interplay, a time-released um, form that, that would um, also uh, not only bring transit to Nairobi, but deliver um, workers to the very businesses that are, that are located there. And, and right now, uh, uh, transportation for workers and delivering sufficient labor is, is, a, is a problem. Um, outside the city, in the village, uh, an, an active form, um, and I'd, I probably don't have time to go into this completely, but an active form might actually link broadband and roads. Um, uh, so that ro roads are essential for schools and communities, but, uh, but broadband has altered all the relationships between local and global markets. So roads aren't the same. They don't, they don't need roads uh, in, in quite the same ways, and one certainly doesn't need those kind of lap set corridors. Um, but roads can also interrupt the spatial information of the city. They end up inflating uh, spaces and distances uh, for people who are mostly walking or using bicycles, so, so they end up actually, even though they're symbols of some kind of incredible progress, they end up actually reducing information that's carried in space. So just as there's a leveraging interdependence between zone incentive and transit, uh, dialing up broadband for a kind of uh, fixed uh, interdependence between uh, zone, uh, for a kind of fixed service that attracts universities and tourism um, might result in a way of, di might result in dialing down roads, so like more broadband, less roads. There's something that's potentially uh, interesting there in, in, in the way that it would, those having less roads would make it possible to preserve the wilderness and tourism that, that brings, um, uh, uh, that brings extra information back to the city. 
Also, while, while optic form usually results in the addition of building material, if we're rehearsing a habit of mind about a software, an uh, interplay of forces, can we think of not only about uh, turning the development machine, putting the development machine forward, but also putting it into reverse? Can we use an interplay of counterbalancing forces to target or concentrate or even delete development? in floodplains in New Orleans or Bangkok or in the Amazon rainforest or in uh, McMansion suburbia. And I'll, I'll show you this little software very quickly. This is almost like kind of savanna in reverse or a reverse game of Go where the object is clearing <coughs> instead of wall. And the details don't, may, don't maybe matter so much at this point, but <coughs> the idea of um, a little software of active forms that's designing <coughs> interplay itself. So these, um, again, these examples don't, don't provide any prescriptions for what to do. They're just rehearsing an idea about how to do it. Um, a habit of mind. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that, that some of the active forms are not, don't begin as space. Some of the active forms can begin as narrative, um, like a rumor uh, that can attach, the rumor and a, and a multiplier are similar, and the rumor can attach to a multiplier. Um, a couple of years ago, I was invited to a conference for zone um, designers and or zone managers, and I tried to explain to them that I was, you know, I'm, not a, I'm a critic of the zone. Um, I'm a Trojan horse. Um, they were they were very sweet about it, so I thought it'd be a perfect place to um, tell a little lie um, or uh, spread a little rumor. So I spread this rumor that the next smartest zone entrepreneurs have decided the exurban enclave doesn't make any sense. It, all, it, all, the, the, it, it's, it costs too much. It's too much of an investment that doesn't return, and that, it, that it's best to uh, locate zone incentives back into the uh, the center of the city. And they all thought that was like a completely great idea. Even the bankers um, thought it had much less risk associated with it. Remarkably. Um, um, so, so uh, uh, it, it's, one sees how, in the same way that all kinds of irrational stories have attached themselves to the zone, um, the, one can make another contagious form of symbolic capital. And it's at this juncture where we begin to see a little bit of not only some of the potential aesthetic pleasures, but maybe the different political capacities and political inflections of these active forms of infrastructure space. And I think, I think they're different from um, familiar forms of political activism. If, if the familiar forms of, of political activism uh, you know, argue that the strongly held forthright beliefs galvanize a fight for solidarity and decency and justice, um, and dissent uh, stands as uh, you know, resistance, refusal, um, often assuming a kind of oppositional binary stance, it must fight for principles, uh, it must um, uh, protect those who are abused by authority. And at certain junctions in history, it's required enormous courage to enact that, that position. They, you know, David must kill Goliath. Um, but in the, the extra state craft of, of infrastructure space also demonstrates that there are many powerful players who survive on fluid, undeclared intentions, and it, it's very easy for them to toy with or trick dissent if declaration is the only thing that constitutes information. Um, so, and when targeted, they just wander away from the bullseye. Uh, they switch characters in the story. They, they, come, they, they come costumed as resistance. Goliath finds a way to pose as David. And in these situations, dissent is kind of left shaking its fist at an effigy. The, the real violence is somehow happened. They've shown up at the, at the barricade and the border, but the real violence is somewhere over their shoulder. Um, and uh, 
you know, descent has no choice but to try to cure all of its ills with another purification ritual. You know, we just weren't left enough or, or something like that, or, or create a kind of more vaporous er force, uh, uh, um, unspecified enemy of, of neoliberalism or capital or empire. And even that kind of symmetrical uh, binary of resistance can escalate the tensions that uh, that that um, that activism wishes to oppose. So, e so even though there's surely moments, there are moments where must, one must one must take a binary stance, stand up, give it a name. When there are accumulations of power that are especially dominant or authoritarian, confrontation is the answer. But but. Uh, Infrastructure space suggests that there's maybe a, another supporting player for this dissent, um, especially because a, a dispositional register of the work already gives a kind of expanded political instrumentality that's more performative than prescriptive. Infrastructure space tutors a shrewder, cagier counter to these lubricated, stealthy agents um, that are global powers. Um, and, and often uh, demonstrating that it, it might be the, the, the undeclared activity uh, that's, that, uh, that's more consequential than the righteous stance, that the discrepant and the fictional and the sly uh, are, are, are potentially uh, more productive. Um, so just as the most powerful regimes find a way to have a kind of proxy or double, um, what if one imagined uh, an, an, another kind of auxiliary form of dissent um, that's maybe an unwitting, maybe even unwelcome partner of the righteous activist, um, but softens up the ground to make, it, make the righteous activist or the declarative activist have a better chance of success? So in this expanded repertoire, um, one can look at active forms that are uh, you know, very different from opposition, uh, less transcendent, less automatically oppositional, more effective, maybe sneakier techniques like gossip and rumor and gifts and compliance and comedy um, and meaninglessness. Um, so we already looked a little bit at the idea of a kind of rumor um, which is magic, as James C. Scott uh, in Domination on the Arts of Resistance describes rumor as a kind of witchcraft that magically multiplies without attribution. It can't be contained. And tuning infrastructure space is a little bit like uh, crafting a medium of gossip. One can find all kinds of multipliers within it um, and also attach stories to those multipliers using not only organizational but narrative forms. The person who convinced Walmart that, um, that their, their goods would sell better in sunlight instead of electric light, I don't know who that was, it was a marketer or perhaps or something, but, it, but if it had been an architect of, of this kind of infrastructure space, it would have been like a pretty good day's work. Um, and to sort of attach a story also to a multiplier, uh, because the architect who would be thinking about that would be multiplying the numbers of lights in the square footage of all the roofs of all the Walmarts uh, all around the world. Um, the pend is another um, non-oppositional political inflection of some of the active forms of interplay. Um, this is kind of sweet arm-twisting gift, like, like China's gift to Taiwan of two um, pandas whose names, when translated, meant something like unity or reunion. Um, so the zone, and we see in the zone in incentives, the broadband capacity, all po lots of possibilities for a leveraging gift, but they're often not used to leverage anything. Um, they're often not part of an active form of interplay. Uh, in addition to binary resistance, think about the power of a kind of exaggerated compliance that potentially also inflects interplay. Um, again, James C. Scott uh, talks about this wonderful example uh, uh, from Milan Kundera's The Joke in which the prisoners, you know the story, but the, the prisoners are supposed to run a foot race against the guards and they, they know they have to lose. So they, they, they decide to all run slowly 
together. Um, and it's, it's an act of, of, of com exaggerated compliance that brings them together, but doesn't disarm, but, and it disarms the, the uh, guards and delivers them a kind of independence from authority. Um, so in extra statecraft, one can kind of pick one's submissions instead of picking one's battles. So it, 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 it's, and it's sneakier, right? It's an almost invisible, non-controversial means of gaining advantage in a field without drawing attention to the larger strategy. Um, the binary of head-to-head -head conflict is marked by competition and symmetrical mimicry and violence. But another kind of mimicry, the double, is something where one uses, uh, one uses a double to, to fool the world like two twins who know how to fool their parents or, or like the Tea Party movement when they adopted the label fascist uh, to describe Obama. So they were sort of hijacking a word typically used on the left uh, uh, def defensively to describe uh, power amassed through fear and hatred. And this was um, uh, used in this case offensively to instigate fear and hatred and defang the word uh, for its use by the left. And it's like genius double. Um, and uh, we've, so we've seen other the zone cities acting as a double. But it's a brilliant way to, to confuse the world, to steal the, steal the opponent's um, position. Uh, the switch and the remote that we've already sort of uh, looked at have incredible political power. Um, one's of trying to affect something at a distance um, uh, without being detected. And the broadband landscape is filled with those kinds of remotes. Also, rather than engaging the fight, we're risking a kind of ex ex escalation of the fight or being drawn into its vortex. There's meaninglessness and comedy and uh, distraction. Um, and these are, uh, present a kind of crisis to the forthright activist. They would seem to be a kind of evacuation of principles when really they can be the opposite. The misdirections and distractions of hustler, hustlers or Chauncey gardeners are, are, are perfect ways to redirect some intractable political situation. So the babble of the management ease or the special stupidity that we were talking about before are, are in incredibly successful political strategies. Obfuscation, irrational desires, fictions, these are all the, um, have enormous political instrumentality, as does, as does comedy. Um, as a way of reducing tensions. And it's something, again, one can only know how to do. Um, you can't go to graduate school to learn to be a hustler or a confidence man. Um, in, in, an infrastructure space, in the end, is kind of not a duel. One doesn't square up against every uh, weed in the field. You change something in the soil. Uh, it's about knowing not that, but about knowing how. Um, So maybe when we pan back over this matrix space, maybe we see nothing but artistic opportunities. Maybe an additional kind of, of artistic pleasure and excess in the art of infrastructure space. With all of its irrationality and invisibility and discrepancy, um, maybe uh, the, you know, that makes infrastructure space the secret weapon of the most powerful people on earth, uh, too, can play at this game. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do have time for questions. Please simply raise your hand. <laughs> ah, so soon. Um, so when you gave that story about you meeting to the developers and spreading the rumor that the next stage in uh, this sort of neoclassical spatial, no, it's not neoclassical, neo-capitalist spatial movement is back to the interior of cities. Um, 
how much of this is the narrative of your specific architectural agency when you talk about doubles and rumor makers and people who can sort of multiply their effect and if it isn't, then why not? Why can't you be the agent? Although I suspect it partially is. Can you talk about that? I'm not sure I understand your question. I'm so you told this story of you going in front of all these businessmen and sort of sped, spreading the next rumor. The next stage of this development is going back to city, city courts, correct? Yeah. Um, and when you did that, it may or may not have had an effect, but let's say it did. And this whole narrative, you're talking about the agents who have effects on this sort of city making, and you seem to be a plausible principal one, or could be in this environment. Faith popcorn of... Uh, anti-zones or something like that? Yeah. And if so, why not? And if you are, then I guess don't comment and just keep doing it. But. Um, well, I'm, I'm not, I, I am not, I am not the face popcorn of anti-zone. Um, I'm not an expensive consultant that, you know, gets hired to, um, uh, but, um, but wouldn't it be an active extreme architectural agency to be one? In this sure, image. sure. I'm, I'm not, not foreclosing on that possibility. Um, and this is a book. This is a book that's about design. Um, it is a book about rehearsing encounters, rehearsing for encounters with space, rehearsing for those for those moments when when somehow you happen to be in front of a, a zone convention and there's that chance um, to. Uh, to spread a rumor or make a change, um, it, and it's it's it, it, it's ultimately an incredibly practical uh, discussion. Um, so I don't know if that's if if that satis sort of satisfies your question, but it's um, it, it's it's all about uh, acting in the world, um, and in and it's trying to rehearse almost the, a way uh, uh, to. Um, by making a kind of narrative where you kind of have to enact the thinking in order to read a book, um, it's, it's actually trying to rehearse how to do it. Um, uh, not about the certainty of knowing that, but about how. Um. Germ. Thank you. So, code for me is very close to space. It's an abstraction that has an instrumentality to it. So, when you say space is information, it's in this realm of it's, it's sort of mathematics. We can conjure it. Uh, nothing's there. It's empty until we get there and write our mathematical formula. Then the algorithm produces things, right? So, that was one whole part of what I heard you saying, but then the germ is very different because that's more like, oh, there's a place and it's occupied and it has bacteria and viruses and flesh and, you know, energy systems and, you know, we're going to infect it and parasitize it and take some of that for our own goodies. So these seem to me a little bit in contradiction. So, so partly I'm just pressing on the first half of the talk which was about space as the final frontier, space as the information highway that we will put beautiful abstract code in and have things happen, things will be produced, right? So I want to push against that in favor of the germ where, you know, like critters live there in those oceans before the sand is put in to make the shape of the earth. Um, bacteria lives there, you know, birds live there, some people even live there, right, before space is produced in this abstract developmentalist model. So I want to push on the germ thing a little more and get you to think about what is viral about the design mentality. What would, I mean, at what point could the viral, parasitizing, germy designer enter this already dynamic, already occupied situation in order to, you know, intervene before the sand gets put in or before the macadam or the map or the 
zone, right, is, is put down. Yeah. Does that make any sense? It does. It, it, it terrifies me that the first half of this talk would have sounded like a kind of abstract space, the spinal frontier kind of thing. Because, because I, it just... Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, uh, you'll be happy. You'll be happy with the argument because it is, it is, it's, it's about uh, as much as it's kind of grasping at the different kinds of metaphors of interplay, um, you know, it's, it's, it's about the, um, it is, is definitely about entering into the existing. Um, it's, 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 it is lampooning the abstract uh, at every turn. It's about being another hoaxer, huckster, pirate, dirty guy. You know, it's, it's, a, it's about entering into the, all of the fictions and fantasies and stupidity that's already there. It's not, it's, it's, it's uh, the, the kind of rational abstraction is the thing that's, uh, yeah, lampooned throughout. Um, so I, I don't know what I did to sound as if I was, uh, had the kind of perfect rational answer or something like that. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the germ is good. The germ is good. The whole idea of something irrationally contagious, you don't know where it's going to go. You can, um, uh, and, and for the activist uh, to think about kind of the solution isn't vigilant enough in this, in this environment. Um, the code is, it's, it's, a, it's a problem for a bunch of reasons. It, for one thing, to, to be invoking the, the idea of software when I'm, when I'm, when I'm trying to talk about a non-digital exchange of information, it's a problem. Um, I, I'm, I know it's, uh, um, you know, I, 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 I have tried taking it out on several occasions, but this is one of those, this is a book problem too, which I'd love to talk to you about, where, you know, one's writing for a general audience and, you know, you're not going to go into sort of Malcolm Gladwell territory. At the same time, you have to have some kind of like cl clear enough kind of uh, way of modeling an idea. So the code was okay for me because it was about an updating platform. You're never, you're never done writing code, you know, and it, and it really isn't ever perfect and it has bugs and germs too, you know, so... So it, was, it, was a, it ended up being okay with me. I relented um, <laughs> on that point. Um, um. You all were very patient with me. I was trying out a new way of doing this and I wasn't sure if it was gonna work. Um. Hi, thank you for your talk, Keller. Um, I think I might have brought this up in past discussions, but there's, there is an underlying morality in um, the way you speak and sort of what you speak about. Um, and there, it seems this, what you're showing, even the slideshow is a negative thing, right? And you're asking for sort of an activism or a positive, or not positive, but to go against it in a different moral ground. And it can be sneaky or it can be, you know, tricky, but it's still better than, right? So I'm just asking, what is the outline of the better than for you? And it, I think we can all see it in some ways. Like we know to be active is better now, but there are, you know, graduates from in KPF making these decisions that are writing these codes already, but yet they are what you're reacting against. So I just wonder, like, what is the moral ground at which you lie? Yeah, I actually uh, sometimes address that, and I was feeling like I had maybe gone a little bit over the time, so I, I didn't say this, but uh, so, so thanks for asking the question. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't really think about it in moral terms. Um, um, 
And I don't really judge this space as um, kind of good or bad. Um, I think it's pretty easy to judge those moments where there are concentrations of authoritarian power and when there are abuse of other human beings or environment. That, you know, it's not so hard. The, deciding that that is not, not a productive thing is the easy part. It's um, all the rest of it. That, um, but I, I'm not, I don't, you know, object to any of this on, on the grounds of taste or, you know, something like that. Um, so I think the hacker, the sort of hacker or the operator in this might, might use some kind of guidelines about whether the, whether, the organiza whether the disposition of the organization is more or less violent, um, uh, whether the disposition of the organization concentrates information and power or whether it, it, it releases information, um, whether it is isomorphic or, or whether it, it begins to um, dis allow for a more open disposition. So there, there are, um, yeah, I think that's kind of the, uh, and, and when, and I didn't talk about that here, but, but when, when talking about modulating the disposition or when thinking about how do you modulate the disposition, is looking towards ways that reduce violence within them. Um, and, and actually talks a lot, you know, Gregory Bateson gets pulled in at different points and others too, to thought, you know, peop, all kinds of people who've thought about um, temperament in organizations, which is not something we think about that much, but, but really temperament latent in organization, even undeclared. Um, Um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, is there um, an, an unspoken um, idea, maybe that that um, I'm, that uh, you, that's behind your your work or this talk? Um, that in, in fact, given the, the kind of predominance of this kind of space, that that activism is actually not possible anymore and that instead we can only have dissent, which is, uh, and so I also was wondering if you could just reflect a little bit on the differences in your mind about activism and dissent. Are these historical terms? Like did we have activism in the 70s and now we have dissent because all we can do is kind of decline or resist or, or um, dissent, which is a little bit different and to me a bit less um, uh, active than activism. Yeah, uh, right. I it's a I bit agree. polite dissent in some ways. Um. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I guess. Uh, what, what, what were your two words? Uh, one, activism and dissent. Okay. Yeah. No, I think activism. I mean, in this in this discussion, at least, activism and dis. I mean, there are multiple. It's a spectrum of activism, uh, spectrum of of repertoires for activism and. You know, some of some of it is more like a kind of oppositional dissent, and maybe the kind of activism that I'm describing, which I, which which doesn't which doesn't take away, it's, not, it's again it's non-modern. You know, it's not saying that 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 dissent goes away, but it but offers a a, a, a partner that's working with a kind of what, what dissensus, you know, um, that's working in a kind of more. Uh, that's working on all the inadmissible evidence, to quote Ranciere, you know, to, to, that's, that's working on, a, um, on, a, on, an, on another kind of field that isn't necessarily oppositional, um, but that potentially expands the power of activism or the repertoire of activism, but all activism, um, all deliberate, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
um, Yeah, we're very, very much in the in the spirit of, of um, uh, you know that that that, art, that artifacts have politics, um, um, and really trying to ex exploit again uh, exploit some of their undeclared power, um, you know, t and taking nothing away from declaration, but t trying to see the, trying to work on the. Uh, the things we can do, the things we can do out, outside of the confrontation. And again, it's not, not to say that you don't have a confrontation, but the things we can do outside of a confrontation, especially in a world of stealth and sneakiness. Um, um, you know, so again, it's sort of like two can play at this game. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and I, and I, you know, want to be careful to say that it, it's uh, it's always tricky with. With when one talks about uh, an additional form of activism, because you know there's a kind of there's a kind of proper form of activism, and, and so and, and if one diverges the teeniest bit, you know, from from the proper script of activism, then it's taken as you know collusion, or you're working from the inside, or you're equivocal, or you have a sort of uh, uh, moral relativism, or something, you know, ethical uh, relativism, or something. Uh, Whereas this is, it, the, what's being suggested here is really uh, just something in addition to uh, the, the more righteous activist um, that might avoid some of the problems of escalating tension and violence in the very binary of, of, of righteous activism. Uh, maybe to follow up on that a little bit. So since Shenzhen's been around for, I don't know, 20 years now or something like that, and there are other Shenzhens, and if I take your book, which is your a companion piece, as you write, right, and I go to Shenzhen, am I going to find these strange comedy clubs? And am I, if I'm a socio-anthropologist on a research mission, I'm obviously going to have to find evidence for these things, right? as sort of tactile moments, right, of proof that this transformation is going to be, has or will be taking place, right? I mean, that's what you're saying, right? You're, you're not saying these things are going to happen 10 years from now. You're saying these things are eminently going to happen now because these things have been around for a while. Or are these things some projection? You, I'm not sure I understand. You mean... You mean Again, I'm not. I'm not saying there's some kind of prescription for something that's gonna that's gonna happen. Like comedy is gonna overtake Shenzhen. Well, how do you then find comedy? Uh, you, I mean, you talked about comedy as one of the ten or fifteen ways in which one produces a type of resistance to this. So, I mean, I'm you know, okay. So if I'm in Shenzhen, I mean, how do I go out and document the presence of these things? I mean, what would be a a research project. Um, well, uh, I mean the the zone and its promotion and its existence is is, is already bathed in comedy. Um, but uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not sure that one would go there to go there and and see what what I'm suggesting here. Being played out. Uh, I, uh, I mean, what what what's being played out there is is um, you know the, the the opposite of what what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that there might be ways to uh, to in, to engage that um, kind of isomorphic uh, set of. Uh, Irrational neoliberal formulas that are are uh, cloaked in rational uh, rhetoric and so good rhetoric about rationalism, um, and and I think you can see that 
you know, for instance, in the way that the zone evolves incredibly irrationally, um, the people just kind of going after the next shiny thing or, or buildings in the shape of diamonds and dolphins and so on. Um, you know, I think you can see that there's, that there's penetrability there to all kinds of, of fantasy and, uh, and desires. Um, and that, that gives me a lot of hope, the, 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 the way that it's changed so, so wildly, the way that, it's, that, it, that it operates uh, completely parallel to all of the highly paid uh, consultants and so on, and that it's nothing like what they're even describing you know, uh, to themselves with all of their white papers and calculations and so on. I mean, it is nothing but comedy. Um, um, So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's... Um. And I suppose just to follow up on that a little bit, um, just to uh, better understand what you're proposing, uh, is are these kind of parallel resistances something that will be enacted kind of in perpetuity, or is it... It sounded to me like you were proposing that they're a staging ground for something that will come, you know, later. Is that... Correct? Is there kind of the revolution that's going to come, or is this kind of these are these kind of mimicries happening uh, in perpetuity? Well, the, the there's something that happens at the end of this talk that bothers me, and I can't figure out what it is because because um, what I'm really suggesting are those ideas about you know sort of trying to find little multipliers and deltas and little interplays and governors and little counterbalancing engines. And then some of the stuff at the end is about a kind of political inflection of those things. Um, but I think, yes, I think you're absolutely right that what's being suggested is that if one works on this kind of form, it's not like you, you know, it's not the same kind of aesthetic pleasure as when you do the outline and you're, that you did the object, you're finished, you know, that's it. Um, it's another, it's an, it, it's, it's more like a pleasure of a hacker. It's more like someone who sees a constantly updating platform, um, uh, who, you know, where you're work, where you're making uh, things that are, ongoing and time released um, so it's different you know it's very it's very different and it's it's not the revolution it's revolutionizing um, uh, and um, thinking about other tools for 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 making change that can also uh, um, that can, that can also cheat the cheaters a little bit better, you know, like the, the, every, the cheater's going to find a way to get around whatever regulation there is, and it, it, what, what happens when there are linkages that, that, uh, uh, that, that can have dynamic markers, too? Um. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, so I'm kind of interested, um, the kind of solutions to this issue or strategies to oppose this issue that you're proposing are kind of deinstitutionalized strategy. And I think I understand that that's because this is a deinstitutionalized space. But I'm wondering um, what the kind of more formal model of urban planning, which would be, I think, how you traditionally deal with these kind of issues, how you see um, these more informal or subversive or ground up strategies interfacing with the kind of more traditional institution of urban planning. Hmm. Um, well, uh, I guess that um, the, in, in, the, in the more traditional um, institution of urban planning, again, there are cer certain kinds of form, like, like the master plan, you know, that, that is offered. People go down to whatever... Uh, go down to offer the master plan or their their proposal for fixing up the slums and uh, and give it to, so um, but this this again and it's almost like the answer to the last question that it's just a different kind of tool that one is thinking of but that would would be something that exactly a, a, a planner would use um, uh, and and what I'm suggesting is that what we do and what planners do um, 
is something that, that could be positioned uh, to be more important as, you know, to, that could be presenting spatial variables for global governance, that they, these spatial variables are underexploited in, in global governance, that often the problem is spatial um, and people are using informatics and econometrics and everything else but space to address it. So um, it's almost like for those urban planners there on the ground that this is maybe an extra power um, uh. Sorry, I, I, I can say, I wanted to kind of follow up also on uh, more on also the along the lines of the activism and dissent situation because I think, well, actually Al Albert Hirschman wrote about this kind of the exit voice and loyalty strategy, right? Whether you kind of which do you partake in, but I have a question about the tone of the way that you presented this attempt of answering the how, right? I think the the kind of thinking about, okay, we need to think more strategically about systems as, you know, and how the spatial repercussions of it, I think it's, it's clear. But in terms of the tone, I kind of take issue with the subversive, the, that the only inevitable kind of solution is being subversive in this situation, right, about cheating the cheaters. Like, and I wonder if, you know, in pr proposing this in a kind of, to the audience that you have for the book and also in an educational institution, whether that is actually the only way to go. Um, well, I actually think the tone is actually quite um, uh, earnest in time. I mean, not, not, not earnest is not right, but, but practical, uh, practical, resourceful, wanting to get on with it. Um, um, yeah, maybe there's a little bit too much. Maybe, I mean, I take to heart your, your, your critique, you know, that there's some, something uh, too cheeky or too, uh, uh, yeah. Maybe, that, maybe, maybe, maybe that's kind of like too easy or something. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I think there's a, uh, um, I, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the person who's working on this kind of thing is thinking about something quite, quite productive, quite, quite positive. So, you know, this is not, this is not the cracker. <laughs> this is the hacker, you know, um, you know the difference. Uh, this is not just the kind of prankster for the hell of it kind of, uh, this is not anonymous. This is not even like anonymous, right? This is not as binary as anonymous. Um, th this is something that's really quite tr thinking quite quite productively about um, uh, about kind of ex exploiting opportunities. Uh, um, it's not collusion. Um, it's manipulation. Um, tie into the role of uh, uh, urban planners and architects. Philadelphia's zone was designed by Robert A.M. Stern Architects, so they are involved in this too, as well as in the U.S. Um, my question for you is, how many of these places were you able to visit, and how accessible were they to a, you know, someone who didn't work there? Um, I, I've, I don't know how many of them. Just looking at the ones I've been to, even as it flashes by, there's been a lot that I that I haven't that I haven't been to. Um, in most of the ones that are kind of proposing themselves as a city, yes, you can you can go. You can't go to then parts of them like the the you can't sometimes get to the into the container ports or anything like that. Um, I mean, you because you, if you have any, especially if you have a camera or something like that, you can't go into. But the ones that but the but the software parks and things like that, people are very quite proud. You know, this is this, these are objects of incredible pride that are being shown off um, uh, as, as as part of these aspirations, urban aspirations. So it's only the kind of secret bit, and of course you can't get into the you can't get into the kind of gray space of a macchiadora. Um, uh, some friends of mine have done films and um, tried, you know, tried to get some footage, but you can't, you can only see like what I showed you, you know, you see from the gate 
um, um, there, I mean, there's some of those spaces which, uh, if you go online, make it look as if um, it's all transparent and there's kind of, you know, virtual tours of all of it uh, showing, you know, young women in um, crisp uh, uniforms and so on. And it's, and it's some of those that, that in which some of the most grisly and horrible things take place. So it, it's, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's very hard to know about that. And then, and then also in, in, of course, these zones, the domestic labor is even in worse trouble, right? Because there's no, no way to see what's going on there um, in those private spaces. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your questions.